Happy Easter. I also want to welcome everybody who's joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us today, feel a part of what's going on. We do have baptisms happening today, and we are ready for people who want to get baptized at a spur of a moment. And you might think, well, why would I do that? Because actually in the Bible, that's usually how it happened. People put faith in Jesus, and they think, I'll do it now. I mean, think of all the dumb, impetuous decisions you've made in life that you regretted for years and years and after. Why don't you do something impulsive without a lot of thinking for something good that you're going to be grateful for for the rest of your life? I remember when I was baptized, my was a spontaneous drop of the hat, decided right there and then, wasn't prepared, and I remember it the rest of my life. Now, my experience, nobody was ready for me, so I went home wet. Our experience, we're ready for you. We have... <laughs> Brand new towels. Nobody's ever used them. We have shorts for you to wear. T-shirts you get to take home. And you get home with the T-shirt. We have hair care products. And wait, we have a hairdresser in the house. Where's Tanya? Where are you? There you are. We'll send you home looking better than what you came in today. We could probably put highlights in your hair, give you a curl, a wave, a perm, send you home looking so good. And you're going to feel like you did what, it's not just the right thing, it's more than that, it's what pleases God. Now, this isn't my idea, this is what the Bible says. Jesus said that we are to go and make disciples, it's like an apprentice of Jesus. We're not here just doing church stuff, but seeing people become new from the inside out. And baptism is where your words become a reality, and we're going to talk some more about that later on. So... Good to have you here on Easter Sunday. We had some people spontaneously baptized first service. Maybe that'll be you in this second service. So good to, good to have you here. And um, today I want to talk to you about what comes after OMG. My grandkids are small. And we went to an Easter parade yesterday. And after, I mean, you can only see so many fire trucks and keep your attention. And I saw a coffee shop nearby, so I did the adult thing and uh, left them. The parents were there. I left them with the parents. And <laughs> <laughs> Not that dumb. <laughs> and I got some coffees and brought back some pastries, and it was a great experience. And while I was in there, they had a list of cookies. And I'm looking through the normal chocolate chip peanut butter. One stuck out, stood out to me. It was OMG. And I thought, well, that's cool. That's my title of my sermon on Sunday. So I got the OMG cookie. I'll tell you that the Pie & Co. OMG cookie is definitely a cookie worth getting. But it reminded me of how many people pray that prayer. Oh, my God. In a time of crisis, a time of despair, maybe a shock and surprise. Oh, my God. Okay, you got God's attention. What next? Because usually when you hear somebody say, oh, my God. They don't add anything more to the prayer. And you can almost imagine God in heaven looking down and saying, okay, you got my attention. What do you want? And we just go about our life. Wouldn't you like to know what to pray next? This is exactly what Jesus prayed when he was on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Staggering words coming from the lips of the man who is the Son of God, who lived forever with his Father in heaven, who came as a baby to live here on earth, grew to, of course, be a man, and who knew the Father so closely. He said, I and the Father are one. He's on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, if Jesus felt alone, then it's okay for you to feel alone. Some of you today are feeling really, really alone. Some of you are right on the very, very edge. Some of you today would love a way off of this planet. Can I tell you, this planet matters, and your presence here makes a huge difference. We need you. Some of you right now are really discouraged. You can't figure out how it's going to come together. My mother used to pray at those times, God, it's going to be interesting to say how you get us out of this one, and God's going to get you out of it somehow. Some of you right now are worried about paying bills or worried about broken relationships or addictions, all those frustrations of life, and you say, oh, my God, what do you say next? And that's the power 
of the words that we're going to look at today. We're in a chapter of the Bible called Psalm 22. Psalm is a book of songs. They are strong from the heart. And this psalm is written by the same guy who in the next chapter is going to write, The Lord is my shepherd. But in this chapter, instead of talking about the shepherd who cares for the sheep, he's talking about the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. It's Jesus. And a thousand years before Jesus died on the cross, it's like frame by frame he describes every Easter movie you've ever seen. A thousand years in advance. And those prophecies are fulfilled to show that God hadn't forsaken Jesus at all. Now, crucifixion is a painful way to die. We use the word excruciating. Oh, my back is excruciating pain. Do you know where that word comes from? It's from Jesus. It literally means out of the cross. Excruciate has in it ex out of crux cross, out of the cross. You're describing the pain Jesus felt as he died. So crucifixion requires three nails, two in the wrists and one between the two ankles binding the person to the cross. And every breath is excruciating. People die in crucifixion from suffocation. And the pain of the crucifixion is that every breath requires exertion, pushing up on that nail, pulling up on the wrist. It's just incredibly painful. Jesus only spoke seven sentences from the cross, and every one of the sentences was about someone else and not himself. And in these sentences, he had to think through carefully what he said, and one of them was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Wouldn't you like to know what Jesus was thinking about as he died? Some of you have been with loved ones as they've passed away. And there's those long hours of quietness and labored breathing. This is what's happening with Jesus on the cross. And outwardly, there's no sign. But inwardly, there's a lot happening. We literally know every single thing that went through the mind of Jesus as he died on the cross. Because it's all recorded for us here in Psalm 22. Word by word, it's all there. And what Jesus went through, he went through not for himself, but for you and for me. So that what took place 3,000 years ago, well, 2,000 years ago, sorry, the psalm was written 3,000 years ago. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. Over 6,500 miles away, Jerusalem's a long way from here, can become incredibly personal. This can be the year you personalize Easter, you internalize Easter by simply putting faith in what Jesus has done for you. So what do you pray after OMG? How do you pray a prayer that changes things? Well, it's all for us in Psalm chapter 22. We're going to look at three different parts of the psalm. And the first one is that God saw your troubles coming. Can you just say that? God saw my troubles coming. And somehow it helps. Because if he saw it, that means he can deal with it. So God saw Jesus' troubles coming a thousand years in advance. If God could see this a thousand years in advance, don't you think he could see into the future of how he would solve it and resolve it? If God could see Jesus' troubles coming, what about yours? What if you knew that a thousand years before you, were exi you, you existed, God saw every problem that you would face? Uh, marriage breakup, uh, business breakdown, um, addictions that you can't seem to escape from. Um, all those problems of life that we face, he sees all these things coming. And you and I see the problem, but he sees the potential that's beyond it with our faith. Because everything ultimately is about our faith. You are here today on purpose. God got you here. You think, well, my, my friend asked me, I saw something on Facebook. Oh, or, no, I come here once a year. This is my Easter thing. No, God wanted you here today. Because he saw your problems coming. He prophesied that you would be here. And he wanted you to receive a word of hope and a word that would change your whole life. So how do you get that perspective? How do you get that long-term perspective? Perhaps you've met a person of faith who has that perspective, and you think, how do people think like that? I, maybe you're the kind of person you're just filled with anxiety and worry, and, and you're wondering, how do you get that perspective? Well, pray like Jesus prayed. There are two prayers that he prayed. We, we don't hear them with our ears, 
but we know they were in his heart because he would have memorized this entire song, just like you know a song that you love. And he prayed, why are you so far from saving me and so far from my cries of anguish? Jesus is ticked off with his father. And you might think, well, that is a very uh, irreverent prayer to pray. I should be telling God how wonderful he is and how much I want to serve him and help him. That would be a prayer that would please God. No, it wouldn't at all. God loves your honesty, your bluntness, your courage to tell it like it is. In fact, the Bible is filled with people who pray from their gut exactly what they feel and let God sort out the motives and intentions and the right words after that. When was the last time you just told God what you thought? I mean, really what you thought. That would be a prayer that would please him. And Jesus prayed that prayer. And God didn't stay far away. God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So obviously God was not displeased with that prayer. And he goes on and he says, you are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Now think of it this way. Your life is careening out of control like a car flying down a mountain road wouldn't you want somebody behind the wheel who knew what they were doing like a professional race car driver you would want that you would want god to be in control of your life jesus take the wheel how does that happen by giving god praise he says you are enthroned upon the praises of israel that means that when you and i praise god we literally say god here's a chair Sit in it, take over, this is your throne. When was the last time you got your eyes off of yourself and put your eyes onto God, off of your problems, onto the potential of what God can do? This is what worship does. Some of you are one playlist away from changing your life. Some of you are stuck in country western music. You know how it works? You play it backwards. Everybody gets married again. Their kids come good. Their bills are all paid. Uh, you, some of you are just one playlist away from everything changing. Getting your eyes off of yourself and putting them onto God. A friend of mine was dealing with deep addiction. And he had to drive through the red light district of our city. I live another place. And he had never heard that there was even Christian music. He had no idea back in the days of CDs. And I gave him his very first Christian CD. And he said, listening to that CD is what got him through the red light district every day as he had to drive home from work. It's amazing what praise does. Get your eyes off of yourself onto God, but more than that, God sits in and he takes over. And you give God the problem. I told you about my mother. I just loved her little prayers. One day she couldn't pay the bills. My mother was a bookkeeper. She had money for everything tucked away. She had everything organized, but she didn't have money for these bills. My dad was studying for his, his eventual career. And so she made all the bills, put little dates in the corner when they had to be mailed. She laid them on the couch. She said, God, this is your problem. <laughs> Solve it. That was her prayer. And that can be your statement of praise. You say, well, how is that praise of God? Because you're really trusting him with the problem that you face. And she said, every bill was paid. There's something so powerful about praising God in the middle of our problems. Now we're going to get deep into this psalm. Here's the next one is, God is with me in my troubles. Can you say that? God is with me in your troubles. There's somebody next to you who needs to hear that. Look at them in the eye and say, God is with you in your troubles. He is. So this psalm is, first of all, a vision of David looking a thousand years into the future. But it's also a vision of Jesus of his own crucifixion on the cross. Now, here's something interesting from history. The Romans crucified somewhere between 100,000 and 150,000 people throughout the Roman Empire. Actually, not that many when you think of how many people lived. So about 100,000 to 150,000 people crucified. There is not a single record in any ancient scroll of Roman history that tells us anything about crucifixion. We know nada, nothing. The only historical documents about crucifixion are in the Bible. It's the description of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the crucifixion of Jesus. The only description of Roman crucifixion. 
And all of these are the perspective of people looking on the cross of Jesus. People who cared about him, but from the outside looking in. But Psalm 22 is different. It's actually Jesus looking upon himself. Now, what's even cooler about it, he's looking at himself a thousand years in advance, and because he's God, he can do that. So that's incredible perspective. It's going to be encouragement to him to remember that God is with him in his troubles, but it's also an insight for us to understand not only how he died, but why he died. Jesus died for you. If you had been the only one, he would have died. It's like frame by frame, the crucifixion of Jesus is revealed to us a thousand years in advance through the eyes of Jesus. He says, they pierce my hands and feet. Notice it's written in the first person. He's talking about himself. A thousand years in advance, before they had invented crucifixion, Jesus is describing crucifixion. They pierce my hands. They pierce my feet with nails. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Uh, one of the side effects of crucifixion was just incredible thirst as a person basically gagged to death. And Jesus would, of course, say, I thirst. He was not just thirsty for water. He was thirsty for God. He's saying, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. He's just incredibly thirsty. And then he says, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Have you ever wondered why they did that? It's puzzling to us because we live in a world of machines that produce vast amounts of clothing at incredibly cheap costs. You can buy anything you want and fill your cupboard and you can't figure out what to wear that day. You know, this is the world that we live in. Uh, the world of Jesus, clothing was incredibly precious. In ancient times, clothes could be more valuable than gold, especially a seamless garment. A seamless garment was a big deal. This meant that there was somebody in Jesus' life who cared for him a lot because it would have been handmade by somebody at home. And if you've ever knitted a sweater, you got a feeling of where this is going. This is a beautiful garment. It is so beautiful that even Romans who understand what quality means look at this and say, whoa, this is something special. We're not going to divide this. We're going to gamble over it. You ever have people gamble over your reputation? Play games with your name? And if you've ever been there, Jesus has been there. He knows exactly how it feels. And he can redeem your name. His name is above all names. He can do something with your name and your shame. This was all recorded before it happened through the eyes of Jesus. He says, all who see me mock me. It goes on and it says that a pack of villains encircles me. So Jesus is surrounded by crowds. The crucifixion happens on a public road. This was part of the shame of crucifixion, is that a person had to hang with their crimes put above their head, and they would be at a public place. It was a place of refuse. So the cross of Jesus happens essentially at the city dump. This is a place of shame. It's a public place. This pack of villains, it's describing a thousand years in advance that there would be a thief on the right and on the left, one who would curse Jesus, make fun of him, the other one who would say, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, just remember me. To be honest, pathetic prayer. Certainly not good enough to get a person into heaven, but it did. He said, I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. That guy went from death row to the front row of heaven. He's the first guy there. <laughs> he gets into it, really not to himself. But just to think, that man, didn't he have time to pray a sinner's prayer in a correct way? He never had time to get baptized. He didn't go through the Alpha course that we have. He didn't come to church on Sunday. He didn't tithe. He didn't get involved in ministries. He, he didn't kick any habits or anything. This guy simply said, remember me. And it shows how little faith it takes to follow Jesus. And you might think, oh, I'm not really a church person. I'm not really a religious person. All it takes is faith. Small faith. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. These are the words they would speak. It says in the book of Matthew, in chapter 27, that those who passed by him hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and said, the elders mocked him. He 
Trust God, let God rescue him. What they're doing is throwing in the face of Jesus the very blessings and promises he had received from his father. His father had said, this is my son whom I love, I'm well pleased. And now they're saying, well, if you really are the son of God, get yourself down from there. Save yourself if you're really the son of God. But because he was the son of God, he wouldn't save himself. He gave himself for you because he couldn't save himself and save you at the same time. I spoke to a first responder in the first service. He heard me say that. He said, you described my whole career. And he told me this week how he rescued a person from death. And he said, as he drove away, he said, I realized I saved that person from death. And Jesus is the ultimate first responder, not just of one victim, but of the entire human race, not just of today in 2024, but of all history, from Adam and Eve until now, until the end of time. He has covered all human need and pain and aggression. He can because he is the son of God. He didn't save himself so he could save you. And then it goes on and it says, I can count all my bones. Even further, he says, all my bones are out of joint. And you can see Jesus hanging on the cross. It, it, by the way, it's good once in a while to think about this. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. That takes some imagination. Have you imagined yourself dying with Jesus? This is the whole faith. He's looking at himself. All my bones are out of joint. I can count all my bones. It's, it's not looking good. But one thing he doesn't say is, I got a broken arm. He doesn't say I have a broken leg. There's no bone that's broken on Jesus because he's the perfect sacrifice. He is the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The perfect sacrifice couldn't have any mark, any blemish. I went to Israel and I was taken to the site where they have, through careful breeding, selected these are Orthodox Jews three heifers, uh, according to rabbinical law. And they showed me these heifers, and they said, we've inspected these heifers with a magnifying glass to make sure that there's not a single hair on these heifers that is imperfect. And I began to comprehend how, what perfect means. Jesus is beyond that, the perfect sacrifice. Now, here's something that's really interesting. In the Bible, if you've spent any time reading the Old Testament, you'll see that there are all kinds of sacrifices, all kinds of rituals. Did you know that there's not a single sacrifice in the entire Old Testament that will forgive what's called the sin of the high hand? That means you choose to do it. You deliberately lie. You deliberately harm someone. There's no forgiveness for what's called an intentional sin. All the forgiveness is for unintentional sin. That means that the rivers of blood that flowed from the temple did nothing to change the human condition. But the death of one man, Jesus Christ, has forgiven all sin, past, present, and future, because he is the Son of God. And the proof of this is he's been raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father to pray for us. He is the absolute perfect Lamb of God. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Jesus not only looks at his body, it's almost like with an MRI or a CAT scan, whatever it would be, he examines what's happening inside of his own body. He says, my heart has turned to wax. He goes on, he says, I'm poured out like water. What he is describing is his medical condition. There is a remarkable medical journal. Some of you who are medical people will know the New England Journal of Medicine. It is the penultimate uh, standard of medical research. There were five eminent physicians who performed through reading the histories an autopsy of the death of Jesus. In there is a fascinating study of crucifixion, and they came to the conclusion that Jesus did not die from crucifixion. Even the Romans said this. They were shocked that he died only in six hours, that he had died so soon. And it wasn't because he was weak. Jesus was strong. By the way, any perception you have that Jesus was weak is a total misunderstanding of who he is. He was a man who brought much respect. So what killed him? We know that when they pierced his side to be sure he was dead, outflowed water with blood, a large amount of water. The doctor said because of that, he was a victim of hypervolemic shock, meaning literally a broken heart. The sac around the heart had inflamed 
with fluid and that piercing revealed what had medically happened inside of him. So as he hung on the cross, he prayed two simple little prayers. One was, into your hands I commit my spirit. That was a prayer that every Jewish mama taught her little boy to pray before you go to bed at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. Well, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the second thing he said was, it is finished. He didn't go out with a whimper. He went out with a shout because he had won the victory. And then his heart broke. He died for us. Jesus said before his death, I willingly lay down my life and I willingly take it up again. Nobody killed Jesus. He gave himself for us. He chose his own death so that he could give us life. Now it gets really interesting. He says, I am a worm and not a man. And when I read that, I'll be honest, for years I've been reading that, just kind of struggling because in my theology of how we're made, I can't really imagine that God would want to identify us with worms. You know, there's other insects. I'd rather be a grasshopper or something else, but do I have to be a worm? It sounds very, very gross. And I dug into the original language. Of course, the Bible is not written first in English. It's written in other languages. One of those is Hebrew. In this particular scripture... There are two words for worm that the author could have chosen. One is called rima, and it means maggot. Thankfully, that's not the word used. The word that's used is tola, that's related to another word for red. It's referring to a unique insect in the Middle East from which we get scarlet dye, red dye. Now, here it gets really, really interesting. God's in all the details. This tola, this particular bug. It's called the, the scarlet uh, worm. The female attaches herself to a particular species of oak tree, drills into the bark, just draws out the sap and the life of the tree, and she gives birth to the larvae that she is going to bring into the world, and she hides them with her body. Hold on to me. Hold, hold on to the story, because there's going to connect into the cross of Jesus. She protects them, and then in this process of birthing, in this process of hatching, these little beings secrete this red dye that saturates the tree. And I was looking online. I couldn't find one with enough resolution to give you a good picture. But what I saw were trees that were just stained in red splotches with these bugs. There's a picture. Jesus says, I'm like this scarlet-giving insect, protecting its young. I'm protecting the human race. I'm giving my blood so that they can live. Jesus was protecting you and I on the cross from the ultimate thing of all. We are protected from every satanic plot against us. He is the sacrifice given for us. Jesus would say about his death that the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a Ransom for many. And that ransom was the devil coming after you and me, and Jesus' own life was the ransom. But the devil was tricked in the ransom, wasn't he? <laughs> because the Father rose Jesus up from the dead. If you want any proof that the Christian faith is true and that it works, if sins can truly be forgiven, if a conscience can be cleared, if you can have a good night's sleep, if you can be set free from anxiety, the proof is in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. When they laid Jesus in the tomb, this was his absolute statement of faith. Because a dead man can't put his hand on his head and say, be healed. Jesus could perform many miracles, but he couldn't perform a miracle on himself. Jesus was dead when they put him in the tomb. And so the scripture's clear. It says, God the Father raised Jesus the Son from the dead as a proof that his sacrifice was complete. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. 
Some of you are one prayer away from the best sleep of your life. You're filled with anxiety and worry and dread. You can just be set free from all anxieties, all these phobias. There's just another form of distrust. It's another form of the way the enemy is working in your thinking, but it's the power of the blood of Jesus that breaks the power of every curse and can set you free. And it requires total trust. You say, well, how do I trust God like that? Pray like Jesus. This is what he prayed from the cross. Upon you I was cast from birth. Jesus is telling you how to come to him. So when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, uh, we see the beautiful Christmas cards, Jesus in the manger, but there's also a dark story behind that. There's an evil king. His name is Herod. He is power-hungry, incredibly insecure. So when Jesus is born and he receives news that he is born king of the Jews, he puts to death all the infants of Bethlehem. I've been to the place of Jesus' birth, the, tomb, the, 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 the caves of the nativity in Bethlehem. There's one where Jesus was born, and then around the corner is another one. And that's where they found the bodies of infants, small little babies, from the first century, from the time of Jesus. And the guides will tell you, this is where the infants were placed that gave their lives for Jesus. And Jesus says, my whole life was cast upon you from birth. He lived because babies died. Of course, Mary and Joseph escaped to Egypt. But Jesus is saying, now I'm giving my life so that others can live. Jesus died for you. I mean, you may be wondering, how can the death 2,000 years ago, 6,500 miles away, make any difference in my life today? It's by faith. Faith that's expressed in a prayer of saying, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. Jesus is my Lord. And that faith and repentance brings you into new life. But it also takes more they say, more? Yeah, more. Because there's the doing as well as the believing. And Jesus said that we are to make disciples by baptism. Now, we live in the city of Seattle where we figure everything out in our head. And so we can code in our head and we can engineer in our head. But you can't follow Jesus just simply in your head. This is why a lot of you are really frustrated, you're filled with anxiety, and you're trying to control life with your computer, and no matter how much you control, you're feeling like life is spinning out of control. That's because you're trying to do your whole faith in your head. And even coming in this room won't make you a Christian, singing a thousand songs isn't going to make you a Christian. Here's how you follow Jesus. Repent and be baptized. It's the believing and it's the doing, because baptism has power, most of all because he called us to do it, and he did it first. By the way, Jesus followed, asked us to follow him, and he was baptized, therefore he calls us to be baptized. But the Christian faith doesn't work until you make the step to be baptized. Because faith without works is dead. When you step into that water, you identify with Jesus. So what's going to happen is you're going to go down in the water, and we're going to hold you down there for as many sins as you got until you feel into the separate. We did this one baptism with a guy. He said, listen, when you put me down there, wait till I tap you on the arm to bring you back up because there's a lot of sins I got to deal with. <laughs> By the way, that's not going to happen. It's pretty quick. We just take you down and bring you up. And what's going to happen is powerful because you're going to die with Christ and you're going to rise with Christ. You identify with him. And what happened 2,000 years ago, 6,500 miles away becomes real for you. Have, you. have you made that step? You know, you know what's going to happen in your brain is you're going to think, oh, i got stuff to do. That's the devil, because the devil will fight against you being baptized. And I've, I've been a pastor for 42 years, and I've seen all kinds of people squirm the way out of baptism, and you, you just watch the devil get into the thinking. They'll be on the edge of baptism and think, oh, I'm not good enough. By the way, None of us are good enough. Christ is good for us. If the thief can go from the cross to heaven, he'll take anybody. You just have to believe. I had a friend who got baptized. He said, well, I got baptized and my life didn't change instantly. No, it didn't. That's not how it works. It gives you a place from which your life begins to change, a point that you go back to by faith. And what God began there, he's going to continue to work out in my life. Have you made the decision to follow Jesus fully, to be a disciple 
Not just a spectator kicking the tires, but actually get in the car and drive away from the parking lot, fully invested in the thing that you bought. God saw it coming. God is with you in your troubles. And God is planning your comeback. There's one more prophecy. (laughs) But this prophecy is about you. The prophecy is that Jesus, from the cross, saw you following him, but it won't be fulfilled until you put your faith into action. He said, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. He's talking about Seattle, Washington, as a place where people would turn to him. He went on to say, from the cross, if we could go to the next verse, guys. Thank you. Posterity will serve him, and future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn he has done it. And you and I are the generation that had not yet been born. This is the day, the day of salvation. Therefore, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What gave Jesus joy as he hung upon the cross? You believing in him is what gave him joy. And today, whether you're watching at home online or you're watching here in person, your faith in Jesus will bring you joy. It'll bring the angels in heaven joy. And most of all, it brings joy to Christ himself that his sacrifice was worth it all because you believed in him. Just before I got up here to speak this morning, I got news about a dear friend in our church. Um, His name is John, and his health prognosis is not good. It looks like his days on earth are are numbered. You could know John a few years ago, just full of life, full of passion, incredibly insightful and energetic and active in the kingdom. And a disease has slowly wasted his life away. But I remember in 2013, it was on an Easter, the week before Easter, Palm Sunday, I wanted to inspire people about baptism. And I had the baptism tank set up here. I said, you know, next week we're going to do baptisms. And, and at the end of my message, I jumped in the baptism tank and I jumped out and I said, uh, who will follow Jesus in baptism. And that Easter Sunday, we had 42 people get baptized. It was awesome. And one of them was John. He came up to me after that service, and he said, wow, he said, that really got my attention. I've been going to church all my life. I realized I've never been baptized. I've got to get baptized to follow Jesus. There's one for you. You could go to church all your life and never be baptized and think you're a follower of Jesus, but you're not. You're a church attender, but you're not a follower of Jesus. He made the decision to get baptized, and his son also got baptized. His son was in grade school at the time. Years go by. Son went to college. And you know there's that change that has to happen between your parents believing and you believing for yourself. Well, when the news came about dad's health condition, his son Preston made a decision to come back from college and devote himself to care for his dad in his last months. And he's our keyboard player playing right behind me. That touched me really deeply because I realized Easter Sunday makes a difference. You might think, ah, it's just, you know, it's it's forever, forever. Decisions we make here make a forever difference. My my aunt went to the be of the Lord this last week, and she's 93. She's one of seven, the last of seven. My grandmother prayed, Lord, may we all meet around thy throne. (laughs) And she had some rebellious kids. It didn't look good for a while. But today, they're all around the throne. Each one of them prayed the sinner's prayer. Each one of them made a decision to follow Jesus, every single one of them. And when my aunt passed away, I texted my family, they're all around the throne. (laughs) Will you be around the throne? They say, well, how do I do that? Put faith in Jesus. In just a minute, I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer. 
You say, well, I don't know how to pray. That's okay. I have the words. And there are going to be lots of people praying around you. I'm going to encourage you to pray out loud. Because Jesus said, those who acknowledge me before others, I'll acknowledge before my Father in heaven, before all the angels. Wouldn't you want to be acknowledged by Jesus? If you're at home watching online, why don't you take a step forward, actually stand up in your living room. Pray this prayer with me. Church, let's stand up together. And church, pray with me as I give the words and everybody else, just follow with me. Here we go. Dear Father, thank you for Jesus. I know that I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I know you're alive. So I speak this to you. Jesus Christ, you are my Lord. Thank you for giving me new life. Amen.